Hello, everybody. I am Christiana Limniatis. I'm the Director of Preservation Services for Preservation Buffalo Niagara. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on our first night of modern WNY 2020. Uh, or I should say our first lecture of modern WNY 2020. Um, I think it's a, an event now with COVID, it's an event that lives in our hearts and our minds at all times, not necessarily confined to the parameters of this week. Uh, but I digress. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, again, first lecture of tonight, we have you here with us on Zoom, but we are also live streaming this onto Facebook. So hello to everybody on Facebook. Um, for the duration of this workshop, how this is gonna work is if we, everyone on Zoom, make sure to have their microphones turned off and their videos turned off. Um, so we can just focus on the wonderful facts I'm going to tell you and the beautiful pictures and information on the screen. If you have questions, which I hope you do, whether you're in Zoom or in Facebook, you can obviously leave them in the chat function. And we have two of my coworkers here with us, Tabitha and Tia, who are working as moderators to help us get all your great comments and questions so we make sure everything is answered before we leave. Well, maybe not everything because I don't know everything, but everything that I'm capable of answering. That's a better way to sell it. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to say, uh, second to last thing I'm going to say is if you see me fiddling around with my screen, it's because while I have my wonderful coworkers with me uh, to help moderate any questions that might come up, I'm still the one in charge of admitting people into the Zoom room. So just keep that in mind if you see me fiddling uh, with some weirdness on the screen. All right, let us get talking about modern living intro to post-war homes. Before we do that, uh, since there are many of you here that are new to Preservation Buffalo Niagara, uh, who are we? We are your local preservation advocacy organization. Our mission is to identify, protect, and promote our unique architecture and historic legacy and connect people to the places they love here in Western New York. Our name has the word Buffalo and Niagara in the title, um, but we have a service area that is actually uh, much larger than the city of Buffalo and Niagara County. We provide services to the five westernmost counties of New York State. And that is a very large service area that we provide services to. Uh, what are those services that we provide? We tend, tend to divide it into four main categories of work. So education, technical service, advocacy, and community development. So education, tonight is an example of education, whether it's virtual or in-person, here to present um, wonderful facts about our built environment to help you better understand our built environment and how to protect and preserve those resources. Technical service, uh, your PBN staff is here and available um, to answer any questions you have as you go on your preservation adventure, whether it's technical, you know, material type questions about how to physically treat a particular part of your building or how to fix something or a preservation planning question. How do you nominate things to the National Register? How do you do local landmarkings? How do you complete your historic tax credit paperwork? We're here to answer those questions as, as well. When it comes to advocacy and community development, they're basically the same exact thing, but we kind of divide it up where advocacy is where we are taking the lead in advocating for the preservation um, uh, of a particular resource or a community or advocating for particular types of legislation that would support and amplify preservation work. And then community development is where we come into your community and give you the tools you need to be in charge of your preservation destiny. Again, we have five county service area. So we can't be at every public meeting. We can't be in front of every wrecking ball. And certainly now in this pandemic that we're living in, we can't be everywhere. So to make sure that you have all the tools you need uh, to protect your resources is very, very important to us. And when I say us, I mean these lovely faces. Um, our executive director, Jesse Fisher at the top, there is me, Christiana, and then Mary, Tia, and Tabitha, who are on the line to answer your questions and moderate for us. And then Bridge rounds out the group. And now we are going to talk about modern living. I will definitely try to pause here and there to catch for questions, but Tia, definitely feel free to interrupt with anything that comes up in the chat box. 
All right, so before we get into the nitty gritty of the different um, types of residential homes that we see during that post-war era, let's just quickly talk about one thing, which is the difference between building types and architectural styles. Um, for the, you know, we often interchange these terms because it can get a little too nuanced to explain the difference um, or just too cumbersome to explain the difference. And then certainly when we're talking about modern architecture, we're still in the process of defining a lot of it. We haven't had that historical time frame when it comes to Victorian era or earlier buildings where we can really look at all of the examples of these uh, types of styles and types of buildings and be able to categorize them. So it's, we don't have that enough time to really come up with the final answers yet about things, but the two things to keep in mind is the difference between building types and architectural styles. So building type refers to the basic bones of that building, the form this, of that structure, the use, excuse me, the use of that structure. Um, some building types have become are so popular, so prevalent that they then evolve into architectural styles. And that's what some of the, the building types that we're going to talk about are kind of on that border of a building type or an architectural style. Building types operate independent of time frames. So for example, a, a, a a log cabin is a type of building. It's described by its materials it's created with, and then the structure and use of the interior of it. If you have a log cabin that's built in the 1700s and you have a log cabin that's built tomorrow, they're both log cabins. So they function, that term functions independent of time and really just relates to those materials or the form of that structure. Where architectural styles are tied to a set of character defining features, decorative elements that define that grouping of buildings that are then titled by a different architectural style. They're built following fashion to look a particular way and to have a particular set of characteristics. Um, uh, Yes, that's what I was going to say. I just stuttered. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so it's defined by that. And then because it's defined by those set of characteristics, the time period does matter for architectural styles. So you might have a house that has um, two houses that have all the same decorations, but if one is built outside of the era that it was popular, then it might not necessarily be that architectural style of the other house, it might be something different. And just to kind of explain this visually, instead of my inarticulate ramblings, let's look at the shotgun house. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the shotgun is a building type that's prevalent in Louisiana, in New Orleans especially. Um, it is basically just the southern cousin of our worker cottage. It's defined as being one room wide and then successive rooms behind it. Uh, that open into each other so they don't have a hallway. Uh, you can also have, as you see in the drawing on top here, you can have a double shotgun, which is two rooms deep, uh, two rooms wide, and then successively behind it. That's what a shotgun is. All of them have that same form to them. How they differentiate between um, shotguns is then by that architectural style that's applied to the building. So down here, we have three different shotguns. They're all technically defined as shotguns, but because of the styles and decoration that they've put on the exterior, they have different architectural styles. So here, this first one right here, uh, it has a lot of gingerbread and spindle work, and depending on what time period it was built in and the other details surrounding its construction, it's most likely that that was probably a, um, a it's a Queen Anne style shotgun. The middle house, again, depending on the details of its construction, uh, what date it was built, it's probably would be categorized as a neoclassical shotgun or maybe a really, really jazzed up Greek revival, but probably neoclassical. And then that last photo on the end is again, a shotgun, but with a craftsman style influence on its exterior. So again, kind of understanding the difference between building types, building forms and architectural styles. As many, several, uh, a couple of the buildings that we're going to talk about tonight fall into this category where we're really defining them by its form and function and shape and all of those physical things, but they in turn can have a lot of variety in the architectural, the, the decoration on the in exterior. Excellent. So let us move on to our styles. 
Um, when we look at these modern styles, so from the end of the 1800s, the turn of the century through today, um, there is kind of right now this general breakdown of describing these, the architecture that we find. Again, keeping in mind that these are still so, so recent that while these are the terms and the ways that we're breaking them up now, there's definitely a possibility in the next 10, 20, 30, whatever years where this might change because we will have had enough historic time, enough time to really analyze and categorize the examples that we have in our era right now. But here's what we're working with. So we're talking about the eclectic styles from about the 1880s to the 1930s, modern houses, what we're calling modern houses from 1900 to about the 1980s. And then what we're looking at now, what's being built today is being called um, oftentimes millennial modern. I think that name is definitely going to be changing in the future. Uh, the reason that we I have the little pink box about the modern houses is because it's those house styles, those building types in that era that we're really going to focus on tonight. But I didn't want to ignore those eclectic styles and the millennial modern because they definitely do play a part in how they influenced the modern houses and then the evolution of modern houses into the buildings we see today. So just quickly, I do want to start off by uh, talking about these eclectic styles. So at the end of the 1880s and into the turn of the century, we definitely have the, um, the emergence of these modern designers, Frank Lloyd Wright, we have Sullivan, we have um, you know, a whole slew of different European designers and architects that are creating what we will later define as what true modernism is. But in that same sphere of where they're working on developing this new idea of architecture, here in America, we actually kind of are feeding into that by turning back to previous influences of architecture. So this time period is really of the eclectic styles is really a callback and an era of revival styles. So we have um, up here in the corner, a house that would be categorized as colonial revival. We have some Tudor revivals, a Spanish revival. And then these two styles aren't necessarily revival styles, but they definitely are things that kind of uh, found its own way in how they were expressed in America. And then the top is Beaux Arts, and at the bottom is neoclassical. Um, so we have this kind of return to revival styles as a way to modernize in a, a weird backwards way. And there's many reasons that that happens. But one of my favorite reasons that I don't think gets enough attention is the role that returning war vets had on styles and trends in America. So when you think about 1880s to the 1930s, that time frame covers not only World War I, certainly, but all of the little wars that America fought to take over land in the Pacific, the Spanish-American War. And so there's all of these opportunities for American men, for American soldiers, and certainly some women, uh, to leave America and go experience um, abroad in a way that wouldn't have been available to them before if that war had not presented itself. So you have all of these soldiers going away and experiencing this completely different type of architecture and styles and coming back and wanting to see that in their own homes. And so that's why we have this a lot of this eclectic architecture and revival styles during this time period, again, kind of ramping up in a backwards way to then encourage <laughs> modern styles, um, which is very interesting. So now let's bring us back into those modern house styles from 1900 to 1980s-ish. Uh, when we look at those modern house styles, it actually then further kind of breaks down. Architectural history is very complicated and loves categories. Um, and so we kind of break these down right now into three categories. So early modern is going to be those prairie style craftsmen and then modernistic. So that means art deco and art modern. So that is the very early stages of modern. We're not going to talk about those houses tonight. I think especially here in Buffalo, we're very familiar with our prairie style and have many, many craftsmen style around. Um, what we are going to focus on tonight are these next two categories. So bankers modern and mainstream modern. So bankers modern consists of minimal traditional, ranch, and the split level. 
And then that shifts into a more mainstream modern with the international style, contemporary, shed, and then rounding it off with a general 21st century modern, which just is kind of a catch all for all the weird little guys that were happening at the end of this time period that again, have very distinctive characteristics about them, but might not necessarily have the firm title for them yet. Banker's modern, what does that mean? <laughs> um, Banker's modern, it's root, the term comes from the fact that many of these styles, the initial three that I just showed you on this chart, minimal, traditional, ranch, and split level, um, directly um, come out of this effort um, and uh, work by the federal government and the creation of mortgage insurance programs. So this starts in during the depression. Uh, you know, everything bad that's happening during the depression, um, so many homeowners are getting foreclosed on, so literally losing their homes. And then for those that are managing to stay in their homes, whether they owned them or rented them, that quality of that housing is, is depreciated, is going down because no one has money for improvements. So we just have an incredible housing crisis of homeless people and in, um, you know, um, not good quality housing. So the federal government uh, kicks off a series of programs to help alleviate that housing crisis. Um, and then those programs are, you know, still in their infancy as we get into the 40s and roll into the actual war era. And they pick up and, and don't miss a beat in providing housing for war era needs. So for factory workers that are moving from wherever they lived in America to meet that war uh, worker need, making sure that those new um, workers have housing needs. And then those programs are fortified and increased to then sub fill the, the need for housing once the war is over, when the GIs return. At the end of World War II, um, you know, soldiers are returning home. They've been told the whole entire time of the war that they've been promised the American dream, the American dream being home ownership. Fight fascism and come home and we'll give you a house. Here are some really great advertisements that really amplify that, that it's literally, it's a promise in this general electric, electric ad that we are going to help you get that American dream, buy that home, have home ownership for you. Um, so there is just this immense need to fill those homes. I think it was the figure was that there was 12 million GIs returning back to America, which is just uh, a bananas number to think of. Um, during this time period and the federal uh, how, loans that were created and the programs that were created, there are about 2.4 million veterans actually take advantage of those programs just between 1944 and 1952 alone. Um, so by creating those mortgage programs, it then trickles and affects the creation of architecture. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more like when we get into the individual style, certainly. So how, oh, sorry, hi, how you doing? Let's go back to this slide for a second. <laughs> um, so in this, not only are they um, trying to get home ownership uh, accessible to more and more GIs, um, it's also creating suburban development. So we're not only giving homes in the areas that we've already um, settled, we're encouraging the spreading out, the suburbanization of our community and um, building more and more out of our urban core. Um, when we talk about home ownership and the change of this during this time period, um, obviously home ownership has always existed in America since the first um, colonizers came here um, in the 1400s. We've, ownership has always been a part of this, but prior to the advent of the Federal Housing Administration and the home ownership programs during this war and post-war era, um, the numbers really skyrocket. So before the Great Depression, home ownership never really got above 50%. Um, I think it got a low of 42% during that time period. But due to these programs and the development of these buildings types for home ownership, home ownership excels to 60% by 1955. So again, we have immense numbers of people not only taking advantage of these programs, but just home ownership in general. 
when we talk about these programs and how these programs um, affected the landscape of post-war residential environments, we do need to take a moment and understand the racist backgrounds of these policies. So just briefly want to talk about that. It's really important to understand that this American dream that they're selling is really only intended for white people. It is not intended for people of color. Um, our racist housing policies in America starts in the beginning of when we get here. Uh, there are land grants and homestead grants um, that take land away from the indigenous and give them to set white settlers, white colonists to settle the this, un, you know, this wild frontier that is America. The land grants after the Civil War, uh, the American Revolution is, uh, you know, one of the policies and one of the major factors into settling the majority of, of New York State, largely central New York and obviously western New York was not settled in, in, in by white people in large numbers before then. It is those land grants that make that possible. And then the same with the homestead, um, grants in the 1860s and forward that make it possible to move to the west and settle that land. Um, and then coming into this era that we're talking about, it's really, really important to understand how these FHA loans, the Federal Housing Administration's um, loan program and the uh, the sister organization, the um, Homeowners Loan Corporation that created these these maps and uh, support information for how to give out these loans and then the FHA manual of how to do all of this, um, it all just kind of reinforced um, disenfranchising people of color. How did that happen? It was through the process of redlining. Redlining is um, came out from needing to grade the different neighborhoods so that those giving out the loans could know and have a cheat sheet, if you will, of what neighborhoods are worth the investment and which neighborhoods wouldn't be worth the investment. Um, unfortunately, as you can see on this uh, cut this map of Buffalo from that time period, um, it often was that the red lined area, the red lined areas that were deemed not poor quality and not safe bets for FHA loans were areas where people of color lived. Um, so understanding that connection where those neighborhoods since the 30s, since the 40s, were not able to access these incredible loan programs that allowed for all of the wonderful suburban developments that we have and allowed for all of these architectural styles that we're going to talk about. Uh, the Color of Law is a fabulous book that talks about this much more uh, detail and much more eloquently than I can in our little five minute thing that I just rambled on it, um, but I would be doing you a disservice if we did not talk about it briefly. Um, before we move on back to our architectural styles, any questions? I'm gonna take a drink. All right, so we've talked about all the housekeeping of understanding where we are and how we got here. Let's actually talk about these architectural styles. So Bankers Modern, modern, modern starts with minimal traditional. Um, so the architectural product of all of that work by the federal government to not only create these loan programs that would help and make it easier and possible for anyone to buy a new home, they needed a house that would fit those loans. They needed them to be low interest, really simple, cheap mortgages. Um, and they needed that mortgage to completely cover the cost of building this house, of buying this house. So how do you ensure that that loan is going to cover that potential home? Well, you get a bunch of architects that are working during the Great Depression and have them work on creating a house plan that will match the needs of that mortgage program. And minimal traditional is that house type. Um, it is crafted again by architects at the in the mid 1930s uh, to meet those requirements of the loan program, and it is just a very basic, simple house. Um, as we'll see in the pictures, there's lots of ways that we can decorate those and change them up, but um, it's at its essence just a simple, basic house. Um, between 1946 and 1949. There are 5.1 million homes built in America, the vast majority being one of these minimal traditionals. So what is a minimal traditional? What defines a minimal traditional? 
Um, they are going to have low or intermediately pitched roofs. So you're not gonna have a super tall roof because we're talking about homes that are only usually one story, one and a half story. Uh, rarely are they two story. And if we do find ones that are two story, they're probably from the late end of its era or have been altered after the fact. Um, again, they're usually gabled, um, uh, where gabled means it has two uh, slopes to the roof that meet in a point. This one on the photograph here is a side gabled. That means that the spine of the roof, the ridge of the roof right here is parallel to the main entrance, parallel to the street. Um, again, small one-story house. Literal, little to no overhanging eaves. That relates to, an eave is the, uh, how much the roof line overhangs over the main building. And so we see here that the edge of the roof, the top of the building is really flush with the side of the building, the wall of the building. So there's really little to no eaves or overhanging. You're going to see double hung windows in these buildings. That's pretty standard, I feel like, but it's very interesting because it's during this time period of the mill at towards the end of the minimal traditional that we have kind of the regulation, uh, uh, not necessarily regulation, but um, the shift to uh, mass produced window units. And so you'll have a real steady uniformity to the double hung windows that you see in minimal traditionals. And again, little to no architectural dis uh, detailing. The original designs and house plans drawn by the federal, produced by the federal government are gonna have no architectural details really or lots of zhuzhi stuff to it because the whole point is that it's a cheap basic house that this sweet deal mortgage we're giving you is gonna pay exactly for. So on, you know, right from the beginning, they're not gonna have that much detail to them. Um, but then as the years go on, we start to see details to them. The economy lessen, loosens up a little bit, uh, public tastes and desires change a little bit, and we definitely see more architectural details to these minimal traditionals. Again, coming back to that conversation of building type and architectural style, these are all still minimal traditionals, but they've pulled elements from a variety of different architectural styles to decorate themselves. Um, so for instance, you know, we have this house that has a used not only you know horizontal siding, but we have some shingles here in the gable, uh, the front gable, the accented gable here. Uh, this one I think is kind of a picture perfect kind of, you know, ex you know textbook example of a minimal traditional. Uh, this one down here it does have two stories. Uh, I have we haven't done the full research of the building, so I'm not sure if it was originally built as that two story or if it's something that was altered later. But with this house, we see the use of this really. Um, circle arch door and the really sharp gables and that kind of gives us the feeling of um, Tudor revival elements being put into this home. And then there are many minimal traditionals that are have hipped roofs. So that means that every side of the building, all four walls have a slope to the roof that meet in the middle, either at a, a pyramid roof would meet at a point, but a hipped would still have that spine in the middle. So you do often see rectangular plan minimal traditionals with that hipped roof on them. Um, towards the end of this time period, again, 1935-ish to about 1950 is that core time period for minimal traditionals. As we reach the end of it, we start to see these minimal traditionals kind of spread out. And that is a variety of reasons causing that. Uh, first reason is that we are seeing the huge move to the suburbs and that where these early era homes are being built in existing lots, either within a more urban environment or within a more developed environment. By the end of this time period, we're really seeing that most of these are being built in these new suburbs. And these new suburbs would then allow for larger lots. Whereas if they were being built in a, a, a traditional urban core, those lots are gonna be much more narrow. So we have towards the end of this time period, these, you know, the ability to buy a larger lot and then build a bigger house on it. Uh, we also, by the end of this time period, are starting to see um, the beginning of the baby boomer generation. And so we are starting to have homes, uh, families that maybe the time period before, during the war, there weren't that many babies being born. So the need for large homes wasn't there. But as we move in to uh, into the 50s, we're definitely seeing more houses, more families that need that more space. 
And then the last reason is that we're moving more into the 50s. We're getting back on our feet, recovering not only from the Great Depression, but the financial um, strain of the war. And so now we, we do have that dispendable, a dispensable income and the ability to spend more on this house and to shift away from only being able to get those FHA loans and being able to pay for more of it on our own or be able to negotiate a larger loan amount than the tiny amounts that might have been there in the initial time period. Uh, these transitional uh, millennial, uh, minimal traditionals that kind of start to elongate and kind of shift us into the next uh, uh, example, which is ranch. Uh, they often were called uh, minimal ranches or transitional ranches um, or the best name ever, ranchettes. Uh, if you are a member of PBN, you recently got your newsletter uh, mailed to you and uh, we highlighted the minimal traditional in our get to know an architectural style column. And uh, I joked that if PBN ever creates, has a band, we are definitely gonna be called the ranch chance. Uh, I don't really play any instruments, so that will be interesting. Thank you. Any questions about minimal traditionals? Excellente. If you do have questions or comments, just keep typing them while I'm talking. No need to wait when I call for them. Uh, Tia will definitely let us know when there are questions. All right. We don't really have a question. Just Keisha Patterson did write a comment that says maybe a few more children, but definitely more space was allotted to each child. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, yeah, everyone has their own story and their family, but definitely just that idea that we're more comfortable, we can have that space. Uh, and the idea that we deserve and and demand that space. Uh, Lustron houses are part of that initial era, that minimal traditional. It's one of many prefab uh, prefabricated homes that pop up. So you have kind of this direct intervention through creating the minimal traditional, creating these loan programs so that people can buy those homes, and then. On the other side, having all of these uh, companies creating these prefabricated homes that can be purchased um, as well. I'm not going to really talk about Lestrons tonight. This was more as a of a teaser for our lecture on se uh, September 11th on Friday. Friday, get your Friday on. Uh, just one more question. <laughs> Uh, Christy, did the minimal traditional, especially in the suburbs, start to incorporate an attached garage? Deb would like to know. I mean, definitely think that that will evolve either initially or as the time goes on. I think originally the house plan, I'm just going to scoot backwards here. So you can see from this ad here, um, the majority of those first generation of minimal traditional house plans that you would see in not only FHA uh, publications that the federal government printed and distributed, but independent companies like Aladdin Houses and, and you know, Better Homes and Gardens would have ads that look like this in them. Um, so they're only going to include the, the main uh, block of the house and not necessarily in give you that, that mortgage money to pay for that, um, that garage as part of the initial construction, but certainly just with the elongation and the um, the expansion of these homes as the time period goes on, adding in those garages is definitely there. I think we can all see in our head different parts, especially of in North Buffalo and going into the suburbs where there, you know exactly that it's a minimal traditional and it does have that attached carport or even a built-in garage, but that's definitely gonna to be towards the end of that era, in my opinion. Coolio's. So Lustrons, I was just teasing to make you come back on Friday and learn all about them. I'm really excited about it. I already decided I'm probably going to have a cocktail and maybe dress up in a weird dress. We'll see what happens. So you got to come. All right. Excellent. Moving on to ranches. <laughs> so again, we have this spreading out of the minimal traditional for a variety of reasons, and that results in this ranch design. Again, the same thing with minimal traditional, ranch is kind of on the fence of being a building type versus a building style, an architectural style. Um, I think initially and, and for right now, it really is a, in its essence a typology, but as we research and, and really look at more and more examples of it, I think it is kind of developing into a style. But who knows, we'll have to look at the architectural historians when we're long gone to see what that answer is. Um, 
So whereas minimal traditional really dominates that first era right after the world, after the Great Depression from the 1930s into the mid, uh, the late 40s, early 50s, ranch then picks up that mantle and carries it on and then is the dominant example of, of new homes being built in that 19, the end of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. It's known by a lot of different names regionally. Um, you know, suburban track house is a common phrase that was used in that time period and certainly today. A uh, contractor's ranch is a term that was used as well. Uh, the key, uh, you know, so the, here's the list of the characteristics. Um, uh, it's, it's broad, one story shape, it's a whole point, it's a ranch, it's, it's one with the land, rambling with the land, and it's one story built low to the ground. It's going to have a low pitch roof. It usually don't have dormers. Again, emphasis on the low to the ground. Uh, front entrance is usually off-centered. Asymmetricalness is very popular in modern architecture. Here we do have that attached garage. That is part of the ranch, either a proper garage, as you see in this picture, or some sort of car port as well. Um, and then there's these uh, ranches are definitely going to love picture windows. Um, that's a big thing. And all of those factors kind of go to supporting the, um, the essence of what a ranch is, and it's divided into three sections. So a ranch has a three-part plan. So you have one part that's for the car, so that's your garage. You have one part that's for living, so that's going to be your, your living room, your kitchen space, those shared communal spaces, which are usually located wherever the entrance to the house is, because you walk into that shared living space. And then there's a space for the sleeping, and so that's usually on the other end where you see not the picture windows, but usually just regular double hung windows, or often, more often, especially in later era ranches, um, you'll commonly see kind of clear story windows or windows that are right up at the edge of the roof line uh, to not so that there's light that gets into that room, but that it's protected from street view because again, that's the sleeping side. Whereas your living side here in the middle, yeah, it's covered in picture windows because you want to show off how wonderful your house is. You want people to see that. Um, and so you'll have those more interesting larger windows in that living part of the house. While there are those that set three part plan and a ranch, you know, needs to have that to be a ranch. Um, this, while it still has that plan, the, the overreaching thing is that by being a long stretched out uh, character to it, it's means to kind of hide that. So while we know that there's that three part plan happening from the street, you really don't totally know it unless you know all the little details I just told you. So it still has that long rambling continuous space look from the outside while still giving you that separated spaces on the interior. Again, as the time, you know, just like with minimal traditionals, the market is flooded with different house plans and, and examples. Um, again, not only, not so much from the FHA handbooks at this point in time, but definitely from a variety of different builders and developers, you know, national chain organizations and local people too. Um, uh, and again, as the time period goes on and kind of emphasizing how ranches, uh, you know, lean towards a building type because as you see in all these photographs there's there is great variety in those little character defining features that you see on the ranch on the ranch they still all are ranches they all still have those key character characteristics of a ranch but decoratively they have a vast difference to them um you know this one down here with the freaking awesome orange squares hiding this car i think it's the carport right here that's very contemporary style but it's still a ranch um, and then, you know, the other houses we see on these ads are a little bit more traditional architectural elements, uh, except for Heather down here. Um, I do want to make a special notice of these Lincoln Home ads. They are my favorite of all the ranch style uh, home makers, developers. Uh, most of their homes are named uh, women names, and they usually kind of correlate in a mean or nice way to the level of detailing and complexity to that structure. So up at the top, we got Marge. Marge is a, a simple lady and she just needs a simple house. And so this one isn't that fancy. 
Carol, a little bit more jazzier. She has a, a large built-in garage and some more kind of space and decorative elements to it. And then we got Heather and Heather requires full length windows. So, you know, that's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> Only my name is Heather, so I could have the Heather house as well. I do just want to highlight this fabulous ranch that's here in our neck of the woods. This house on LeBrun Road was featured in our 2019 Drive Yourself Mod Tour. Um, every year as part of our uh, modern celebration, we have a Drive Yourself Mod Tour. It's a self-guided driving tour uh, uh, across the region to that year's pick of modern masters. And so this one was highlighted on our tour last year nestled in the middle of this ranch row on LeBron. Uh, this house was built in 1959 for the Shrivers. Yes, Shrivers, excuse me. It was highlighted in a 1961 Buffalo Evening News article um, that they, noting that the owners had been inspired by their travels to Florida and California when they had the idea to build, hire an architect to build this home. Um, the best part, I mean, this, it's just a sexy mofo from the outside, uh, but it has a pool on the inside. So it's just a winner. One day I'll try to buy it. I doubt that will happen, but it's great. <laughs> All righties. Any questions about ranches before we move on to our next one? Spectacular. Let us talk about split levels. So, while split level is still kind of categorized in that banker's modern uh, era, because it really kind of um, is just like kind of the logical next step in the progression of this minimal traditional to this ranch and now a split level. But by the time we start seeing these split levels and that they're really dominating the, uh, the new housing construction, by this time, these homes are too large for those um, original FHA loans that were created. So this split level is really kind of shepherd in the new era, um, moving into um, the, the next phase of modernism away from uh, that era that was totally influenced by those FHA created loans. Um, as the name implies, split level needs to be split level. Um, you know, looking at a picture of a split level, it kind of looks like a two story house with a ranch coming out of the side, right? It has a hyphen over here and a two story here with the garage in the basement and living space upstairs. But if we were to take an x ray and look at that, we would see actual little mini stairs to create a split level. So there isn't a true one story, two story like you'd have in a traditional style building. So again, three or more separate levels. You're going to have low pitched roofs, but you're going to have them in multi shapes. So you're going to have this two story section uh, often has hipped roofs or pyramid shaped roofs um, to accommodate all of the, the, the to allow for as large a possible second story on that that side. And then usually on this level on to the side is usually a, a gabled roof oftentimes. Obviously, every house is going to be different, but kind of textbooky examples are going to have that roof shape. You're going to have a variety of orientations for this. So you can have a horizontal, you can have a completely rectangular building. Uh, not all of them are going to look like it's a split level from the outside. Um, but they all will usually have asymmetrical facades. Again, picture windows, every residential, you know, homes of the modern era into today love picture windows. Um, and then integrated garages is, is a, a key component of a split level. Here are some really, really fabulous ads from that time period. Um, again, showing how, uh, how it's marketed to housewives um, that you can have the, as this one on, on the left-hand side with the blue on it, you can have all the amenities of that traditional style house with the three-story Queen Anne that you grew up in, attic to basement, um, but much more manageable with just little split level stairs. That's what a lot of the um, advertising is, is, is geared towards women, that this is going to give you that full house that you want, but still easy enough for you to clean. <laughs> um, again, coming back to having needing to have a split level, here is kind of a floor plan that shows you of how 
a four story split level would work. So you would have this basement that goes into the lower level, which maybe has a garage as well. And you have a living room level and a bedroom level. So those are gonna be your separations. So it's basically a stacked ranch house. So you're still gonna have those separate spaces for the different uses, but instead of being long and drawn out, they're just gonna be packed on top of each other. All right, those are our bankers modern. Uh, now we're going to shift into our mainstream modern. So those are gonna be international style, contemporary, shed, 21st century modern. Um, whereas the bankers modern, those are really just apply to residential architecture. As we get into mainstream modern, these are going to be more styles, um, styles that we see uh, not only in residential examples, but in commercial and public buildings as well. Let's start off um, with, well, just talking about mainstream modern, sorry. Um, so again, Bankers Modern directly influenced by the financial pro programs of the 30s and 40s. Once we get started into the 50s and 60s, you know, we things are looking up, we're recovering, the economy is better, we have money. Um, you know, America is number one. We want to show off the amazingness that is America um, and that we can live beyond our means again. I think that's also a very key thing of this era of modernism. Um, so here we have the styles that, um, you know, very popular and prevalent in these commercial and public building spheres that we then will kind of see uh, some of them in <laughs> um, residential examples, but these are just kind of some key, you know, emblematic uh, commercial and public buildings from this time period. So we have international style example with the Seagram building right here, a new formalism with Lincoln Center right here, just like our m and building downtown here in Buffalo. Googie architecture is those weird roadside buildings. Um, that's right here at this gas station or auto body shop. Uh, we've got neo-expressionism slash neo-futurism with the TWA terminal at JFK airport. And then um, an example of brutalism in a residential setting uh, with the dearly departed shoreline apartments. And so here's some examples of how those really high style things that we think of only in those commercial public ways. And here are residential examples of that. Um, and also just the vast improvement in like illustration of these ads. Like this is pretty, this is pretty great. I could never paint that. And I also love that this man is just like aimless, like just walking with a toolbox in his hand. He's just loving life in the mountains with that house, man. Super great. All right, let's move on to our styles. I'm gonna stop being weird. Uh, international style first up. Um, International style has a lot of similarity with those early modernistic styles, so art deco and art modern. A lot of overlaps there, um, but international shifts um, in that where those buildings had masonry walls, we start seeing international styles supported by structural skeletons, so metal and steel. Um, 1940s, um, you know, international style is spread from its base in Germany and France um, to the rest of the world. It's clean, efficient geometric qualities um, become the, um, the baseline language for what becomes skyscraper architecture here in the United States. Um, uh, so that's really uh, cool. This house right here is in the city of Buffalo, and I oftentimes see it uh, interchangeably being used to, as an example of international and an example of art modern. Um, it's definitely on the fence right there and exhibits all of the care, you know, many of the overlapping characteristics. And those characteristics are having a flat roof, uh, no decorative detailing at a window or door, just very no decorative detailing. Windows are usually metal casements and set flush with the wall smooth undorned wall surfaces and then the common elaborations use cylindrical forms and cantilevered sections so here we see the cantilever section very subdued very um, minimal with this overhanging over the entranceway but here are some other examples of international style so the the main the the kind of epitome of international style the 
big milestone for it in residential architecture here in America is actually out in uh, Palm Springs. It's with this house right here. It's the Dr. Jacob John Kotcher uh, house uh, designed by Albert Frey in 1934. Um, then down here, we got the Farnsworth house um, by Vander Rowe. This house right here in the middle, you see that use of the cylindrical form. Uh, this is in, um, oh, I'm, it's escaping me, East Aurora or Orchard Park. I forget which. It just sold a couple years ago. So people might know what this building is. Um, so while international style definitely emphasizes on those clean, smooth lines and, and certainly the use of white and steel and glass, we see it creep into residential architecture in just regular suburbs, regular homes, at, like these two examples here on the left-hand side. So while it may have those decorative elements that are innate to those brick pieces that are used to build these homes, it still has a lot of those key character defining features of international style. It's just translated into a residential example that is more palatable to the, uh, and mesh, meshes more with the surroundings than perhaps dropping this uh, house in the middle would be into a, a neighborhood in Depew or something like that. Um, so international style. Any Christine? questions? Yes, yeah. I have a question. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Puma actually has a question about uh, the house on Park that you showed. Oh, yeah. Do you know why it's deteriorating? Jerry Puma might like to live in it, own it, I'm not sure. <laughs> so the word on the street, I live up the street, so I walk by this all the time. A uh, word on the street is that the gentleman that lives there is very elderly and um, is just having trouble keeping up that house, as you can see in this photograph. Um, I've heard through the grapevine also that many people have reached out um, I, I don't know if he's actually still occupying the building or if it's owned by the family. I've heard that people have tried to reach out to them to assist um, and or purchase it and all have not been successful. Um, so, I mean, I, I definitely, it's obviously a weird way to navigate. You want to help somebody take care of this building that is absolutely beautiful and really, really significant as one of the only examples of international residential style in the city. Um, but also it is privately owned and, uh, you know, there's not that much that we can do to, uh, to, to make it the beautiful house that we know it can be. But that's what I've heard through the street. On the street, not through the street. Can't hear things through the street. That's stupid. Any other questions? Nothing on the drink. All righties, let us move into contemporary style. So this is a style. Um, kind of think the Brady Bunch with this one. Um, it includes the Brady Bunch house. <laughs> so contemporary style is all about having these um, unusual, massings and forms and roof lines and shapes to create this kind of broad expanse of uninterrupted wall surface, this broad expanse from the outside. We're shifting away from those ranches and split levels where we can tell what type of function is happening in each section. Whereas with contemporary, I don't want you to know what's happening behind <laughs> this wall. I'm not gonna give you a clue of how we've divided this up on one hand. And then the second part of that is that by doing that, it allows the opportunity for much more interesting interior spaces. So you're going to have contemporary style homes that have very lofty, large um, entrance rooms or living rooms that have, you know, balconies from the second story. You're going to have a lot more um, pools on the in in interior, you know, it, um, I can't speak English today. Um, it pools on the inside, uh, more kind of gardening and natural spaces being incorporated into the interior of the home, which again is allowed because you've created this wall of a fence of a building on the outside that allows you to have that space and privacy for those interior spaces. Um, so again, to be able to create those, you're gonna have you know low pitched roofs um, but they're going to be of asymmetrical gables and interesting shapes, like you see with this one that has definitely a kind of mod an inverted butterfly where you have a short side over here and then a long swooping one on this side. Um, built with natural materials, um, here we have wood and stone or uh, uh, it's 
probably a veneer, but not real, real stone. Um, but again, the emphasis of natural materials, because most likely on the interior, they've incorporated that natural backyard, that patio is part of the actual house. And then recessed or asymmetrical entryway. Again, asymmetrical entryways are the way to go with modern architecture. Only nerds are on the straight and arrow. We want it to be weird and off-center. Here are um, much better examples of contemporary, in my opinion. That top one is um, on Middlebury Lane, Middlebury Lane here in the city of Buffalo and featured on our second walk your self-guided walking tour called Delaware Acres, where it'll take you through the neighborhood north of Delaware Park um, and all the fabulous mid-century homes that were built, that being one of them. Uh, the house on the bottom is uh, in Williamsville, Amherst. I took it many years ago and not many years ago, a couple years ago and never wrote down the street I was on when I took it. So it's just in the void of the pan Williamsville Amherst area. Um, with that bottom one, we can kind of see how this is still kind of transitional from ranch. You can kind of see that ranch bones in it, but it's topped with these interesting roof angles. It has, um, you know, this wall of, of, of cement bricks, again, to create that wall and separation from you on the street knowing what we have on the inside. Um, and then this one on top, the Middlebury one is just bananas amazing in every sort of way. Um, yeah, and you'll learn about it on Delaware Acres. You should go buy that. Uh, and then here on the right-hand side, you see this house plan um, from that era advertising these plans. Um, in this time period, you see them actually being referred to as contemporary style homes, as transitional style homes, which is really interesting to see that phrase being used. Um, interesting in a way. Any questions about contemporary? Excelente. I'm going to move on to our shed houses. <laughs> um, shed 1965 to about 1990. I definitely see, I've seen some like new shed style houses being built up, but um, again, these are so recent that we're now kind of getting into this time period of we're still developing the definition of these terms and finalizing if we're going to use the original terms that have been used or if maybe in a couple years they'll be changed into something a different. But shed, as the name implies, the overall effect of this style of house is the bold diagonals and the counterpoints created by the shed roof. So a shed roof is one where you just have that one slope of the roof. Um, and so here we have just every angle of this very complex massing of this house has its own shed roof on there. To am further amplify and accent those angles of the roof line, you're going to see that matched with a wood exterior that's usually vertical, again, to emphasize that um, the multi-directional uh, effect of those roof planes. Um, asymmetrical, again, asymmetrical. No one wants to be a nerd. Boxed window frames are very, very common in shed style buildings. Uh, this one definitely has some, some grade A uh, window boxes and, and, and pop outs of those windows. Um, more often you'll see ribbons of windows or clear story windows. So you're gonna have you know, a strip of windows right at the edge of the roof line. Um, I think I have another picture, yes. Um, so how shed evolves and kind of comes out, it develops, you know, there are some examples and we can see some precursors within the contemporary style movement, but really the shed style starts in earnest in 1965 with the uh, development of um, in outside San Francisco called Sea Ranch. Um, and that's where it really starts. And after that development is built in 1965, we get in 1967, the architectural record where it reviews the house styles, the best houses of that year, and six of the houses featured are of shed style. So within that two year period, it's becoming a favorite of architects um, and, and being built a lot more. Um, here are some other really great examples. Um, I mean, this little guy in the middle, I mean, talk about a dynamic shed roof. This one is even cut away to see the sky. That's an open patio right there. That's bananas. 
Um, I will say that <laughs> the shed style always makes me laugh. Um, for those of you who are on on TikTok, uh, there's a, a a sound, a, a thing going around where people share the weird thing when they were a kid that they thought meant that you were like rich. And so for me, I was always so jealous of my friends that had shed style houses. I didn't know they were called shed style houses, but there was a house down the street for me that looked literally exactly like this one in the bottom left corner. And I just always remember being like, wow, they're really cool. They got a house that looks like the forest. So sheds will always have a very special place in my heart. Any questions about shed style? Awesome sauce. So now we are moving in to the other 20th century moderns. And now as I see this, uh, this slide, I realize on the way back slide, I wrote 21st century modern and I didn't mean to do that. We're talking about 20th century modern. <laughs> we don't really have the 21st century modern yet. So here's kind of just a smashing of really um, either very popular or prevalent or not really popular prevalent, but like the little underbelly guys that had a lot of examples, but maybe weren't the name brand ones like, you know, International Style Contemporary or Shed to really get all of the attention. Um, and also there is a lot more variety in these types of houses and or a lot more architect designed examples of these styles and forms. So they're definitely gonna be a little bit fewer and far between, but definitely still emblematic of this end of the era. So first off is organic. I definitely used the two most <laughs> amazing examples of organic to be in here, but ultimately the point of organic architecture is to have the built environment and nature intertwined. But instead of conforming the nature to that building campaign, you're going to uh, make the building campaign match the nature. And so falling water is certainly one of the you know, most stellar examples of doing that, um, of not conforming and changing that natural environment for your building, but vice versa. And then over here on the right hand side, we have the mushroom house, uh, or sometimes called the pod house, uh, which is uh, just down the road in Periton, New York. It was designed by Central New York architect James H. Johnson. Um, so again, not that many examples of organic, but definitely still something that's it's it's a, a vein and a theme that's happening at the end of this era, 1950s and through today. Um, just recently, um, the uh, nonprofit based in Rochester, Landmark Society of Western New York, they recently um, got a grant and con uh, completed a survey of all of James Johnson's works. So I highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about the Mushroom House finding that survey um, and inventory that they did. It's a lot of really great information about all of his work that he did. Um, A-frame houses. Um, wildly successful A-frame houses. Not that many examples in urban settings or kind of a traditional suburban area. They're definitely much more prevalent in as that vacation house, as that advertisement tells us, and in those more rural settings. Um, you know, homes in a triangular shape have existed since the beginning of homes. Um, so it's not new to create a house in this shape, um, but it's architect Andrew Geller that really reinvents um, this style in this home when he built the A-frame house in Long Island uh, in 1957. It's now known as the Reese House and it's an A-frame house, highly dis and it's named that because of its highly distinctive roof shape. It was then featured in the New York Times. And then soon they were sprouting everywhere and especially getting uh, booklets like this one, house plans like this one that emphasizes the ability to have them as vacation homes. Um, this was also another popular um, later modern era, you know, kit house uh, where you can buy these packages and, and kits to build your own A-frame house out in the forest, in, in the world, um, which is cool. I included this picture on the left-hand side. I had to take it from the tax assessment website because my personal photo of it was not good enough quality to look good on the screen. But I actually, this is from Louisiana, from New Orleans. I actually used to live across the street from it. And it is an absolutely bananas um, A-frame house. You can't really tell because of the shadow, because of the, um, the, the, 
the, the sky and the light. But if you look through this, this curved entrance way here, you can see straight into the house. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And we would joke and call it Scandinavian Gothic all the time because it was just so extra and opposite from most A-frames, which really do focus on the mashing of the natural world into wherever, or you know, emphasis on that natural environment. All righties, that brings us to the end of our modern houses era, our pink square era. Um, before we leave, since I already talked about eclectic styles, um, let me just briefly talk about millennial modern. Again, from that architectural historian side, these are buildings that are happening right now. Um, so, you know, while we might be calling them things now, we might be trying to categorize them. Uh, this is all new architecture. We, we need way more time to properly investigate and categorize these. Um, but it's just very interesting because I see it as bookends. So we have this middle slice that is new, modern, still kind of pulling from older stuff, but a, a new modern era. And then on either end with the eclectic styles and millennial modern, we're going back to these revival styles, back to these traditional elements of architecture, but just reorganizing them in a different way. So those are eclectic styles from the 1880s to the 1930s. Those are, you know, pulling elements from original era architectural styles and just reorganizing them in different ways, like colonial revival, for example. You're taking all of the types of things that you would see in the colonial era, jumbling them up like Yahtzee, and then plopping it on your house. So all of the elements are colonial, but you're putting them in ways that you would never see in the colonial era. Whereas with millennial moderns, what we're seeing is putting all of the decorative elements, all of the character defining features from all of architecture, shaking it up and then throwing it and you get what you get to put on your house. <laughs> um, some fun place, a fun place that you can go to really kind of learn about um, the most, uh, you know, notable and most talked about uh, member of the millennial modern, which is the millennial, the McMansion. Uh, there is a blog um, that focuses on uh, McMansions and really does a great job at taking pictures from Zillow and pointing out the ridiculousness of it, like these two here on top that just have outlandish uh, massing and, and weird combinations of decorative elements that again would never exist in real life. And then uh, there's another trend happening in uh, the millennial modern, uh, which is kind of a, a styled ranch. Um, so down here at the bottom are two kind of examples of that, where we're kind of going back to this ranch style house, the rat ranch form, or even that minimal traditional form, but again, putting elements and combinations of things that never would have existed in that previous era. Um, so again, just keep keeping your minds open and your eyeballs open to see these types of things in the currently being built architecture. And that's all I'll say about that because I'm not a fan of most of it. And with that is the end of our lecture. Is there any question before I sum this all up? Excellent. So today is our first lecture of the series. We have two more lectures this week on um, the 10th, on Thursday. We're gonna talk about the Memorial Pool, North Tonawanda's Memorial Pool. It's a fabulous uh, pool that has a connection, uh, a national connection. So we're gonna talk all about that. And then, like I said, on Friday, we're going to talk about lustrons. I'm super duper excited about that. Um, throughout this week and throughout the month and throughout your lifetime, honestly, you can purchase a copy of our Drive Yourself Mod brochure or our Keepsake brochure and map, and then also the Delaware a Acres uh, for a self-guided modern adventure. Um, if there are no more questions, that is our program tonight. Um, I will leave the screen open and on if you wanna type some more questions in there. Um, but if not, you are free to take off and have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you so very, very much for joining us. Please go to preservationbuffaloniagara.org to register for more of our modern events and learn about all of the other wonderful things that we do. Any last questions? Excellent. I'm gonna turn my screen off. Thank you, have a great night. <laughs> Oh, stop.